Well, that means we're off to a good start. <laughs> um, so we're supposed to talk about literacy today. Uh, and if you look at the various definitions, <laughs> whoa! If you look at the very, shouldn't stand in front of the projector. Uh, if you look at the various definitions of literacy, as I've spent some time doing, the one thing that's going to come across really clear is that literacy has been evolving, and uh, depending upon the time and the place that you're at, and as the tools that we use to do our business, live our daily lives, uh, have changed, so have our definitions of literacy. So I went around and I asked actually, uh, I went to one of the literacy consultants in the school division and I said, what's your definition of literacy? And I couldn't get a very brief answer. It kind of went on and on and on and on. Uh, I asked an English teacher about what his definition of literacy was. And I went around and I started searching on the internet and the definitions go on for quite some time. Um, but the one thing that's clear is that the nature of literacy is evolving. Now, Clarence Fisher is a grade seven and eight um, teacher. He's in Manitoba. He actually teaches in Snow Lake, Manitoba. And at the K-12 online conference, which was a conference that took place entirely online, um, end of October, beginning of November of this year, he gave a presentation on globally literate. And what he did in that presentation, and, and all the presentations from the conference are still archived online. Before the day leaves, I'll, I'll leave you uh, well, you'll have one link that'll have everything in it, including the PowerPoint presentation that'll work, and, uh, and all the other media files, um, including links to Clarence's presentation. And he, he identifies the fact that, depending upon where you are in time, and where you are geographically, the definition of literacy is different. He also identifies these three things that are consistent components of literacy, no matter when and where you are. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines literacy simply as a noun, as the ability to read and write. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard of a fellow by the name of David Warlick. David Warlick is an educational consultant that travels all over North America, and he's exploring the changing nature of literacy. In particular, how our evolving technology is having an impact on not only what we're doing in the classroom, um, but what we're doing in our daily lives, and how should that impact what we do in the classroom as teachers. Now, he wrote a book called Redefining Literacy, and in that book he says that if all your kids learn to do is read and write, they won't be literate. I wonder how that strikes you. He keeps a blog, and on his blog, his blog is called Two Cents Worth, and what he does is he's sharing his thinking on a regular basis. And uh, let's hope this is going to work. So I'm going to show you his blog right now. He, uh, just a few days ago, it was... Uh, it was earlier this week, maybe it was last week, he wrote a post on his blog called Is All Information Knowledge? And what he's doing there is he's reacting to something that he read uh, by another blogger. Yeah, you don't like me, I know that already. It says it's connecting. Maybe did we lose the internet? It's coming? Anyways, in that blog post, um, he talks about an evolving definition for literacy. And I wish I had his words here because the reason I linked to it was because he said it so eloquently, but essentially what he was saying was that um, we talk about technological literacy, we talk about information literacy, we talk about text literacy, and the English teachers know that the word text is a loaded, a loaded term nowadays. Um, I'm just kind of waiting for that to come up. Looks like it's not going to happen. So he says, we talk about all these literacies. He says, but that's not the issue. He says, we're talking about literacy. It doesn't really matter what adjective you want to stick in front of it. It's still literacy. Um, so he says, when we're teaching in the classroom, we should teach the kind of basic facts that kids need to know and should be able to recall in order to do the regular business. But we should also be teaching them how to do what scientists do, how to do what historians do when we teach history. Um, how, how to do what authors do when we're teaching English. Uh, that's, that's not working, and that, that's going to be a problem later. I don't know if there's anyone here who can give us a hand. Um, I'll close that for the moment. Oh, it won't let me. It's, Wait, you keep talking. it's very upset. You keep talking. Okay, so there's different types of literacy. Uh, different types of literacy, so we talked about text literacy. What's text? I alluded to earlier that now in the English exams, the grade 12 English exams, the kids, 
they're, they're saying everything's text. Um, that a, a, a piece of artwork by itself is text. Anything that conveys a message of some sort, anything that communicates in some way, is considered text. Now, I had a, I had a debate with a friend of mine who teaches archaeology, and it's very important, you know, um, in archaeology, they, they're deciphering all sorts of different texts, and he identifies that, he says that it's not text unless it's in a context. Now, we can go back and forth on this for a while, but those are some of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of literacy, information literacy, technological literacy, media literacy. Internet literacy is kind of a new one now. Um, how to read hypertext. I'll give you an example. A friend of mine is a, an English teacher in Colorado, and his name is Bud Hunt. And Bud uh, also maintains a blog. He calls himself Bud the Teacher. And he wrote a post on his blog um, called Going South. Very briefly, what it said was, um, I think this is the first time that my grandfather's name has ever appeared on the internet. The word this was a hyperlinked word. Um, I'm going to be heading south for about a week, so I won't be writing anything on the blog. And I'm going to spend some time in my grandfather's garden. There's an interest, there was an odd undertone to what he's writing. Now, if you follow the link, if you read, follow the text, click on the link, it takes you to an obituary for his grandfather. In the comments that were left on his blog, the first two people that came by leave him comments about stuff that he had been talking about on his blog earlier in the week, and they're kind of getting back to him, saying, oh yeah, I, got, I, you know, I did the research and I found this, you were asking what this means, and here's the answer, which was such an inappropriate thing to say where here he's sharing that, that his grandfather has died and he's going to be going to the funeral for the next week. Uh, and so knowing how to, he, I was talking to him afterwards and he said, you know, maybe I should write some more information there. And I said, I said, no, I don't think, I think what you wrote was bang on. Um, but you know, some people just aren't read, they haven't learned how to read linked text yet. And more and more um, linked text is, we're reading more and more linked text. How much time are your students spending on the internet, how much time are you spending on the internet? I bet they're spending more time than you. But um, don't they need to know how to read linked text? If they're looking at a website, don't they need to know how to check that the information on that site is valid? Don't they need to know how to, who, who owns that site? Who's writing this? Who are they linking to to justify what the, the claims that they're saying? Do you know how to check who's linking to that site and using that site as a supporting source? Because all of these pieces of information come together to make that text or that website valid. That's another type of literacy. Do you know how to check who owns the website? Visual literacy, photographs, uh, mathematical literacy is what we're supposed to be talking about today. And, and there's more, and it goes on and on. Now the thing is, when you try to define all these literacies, what you're going to find is that they begin to mash together and they overlap, and you can't really kind of tug them all apart that one type of literacy overlaps with every other type of literacy. Now, mathematics is a language. And you're, I'm, I'm making the assumption that everyone's fluent in English here. And I bet you can read that no problem. OK. so. I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading, the phenomenal power of the human mind according to a researcher at Cambridge University. It doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without a problem. Now my definition of literacy, the way I define literacy is, first I'm going to come at it from a bit of a mathematician's angle, and I'm going to travel all the way up the ladder of abstraction because I want to get a definition that's going to encompass all these different literacies. So the working definition that I use is literacy is the ability to encode and decode symbols. Because these are just symbols that as English language speakers you've just decoded. And it's, maybe it's a bit of a puzzle, but you can do it. Now I'm going to show you some more code. Uh, now this was taken from a math text. I'm going to bet dollars to donuts. You can't make head or tail to that. It says multivariate analysis states that an isodensity contour ellipse 
is the intersection of a plane parallel to the xy plane and the surface of a bivariate normal distribution. Yeah. <laughs> so there it is decoded. Now this, there's, there's some consequences of this, I think, for teachers of English. I know like now, my daughter's in grade one. My daughter's name is Amelia. We're going to talk about her later t this afternoon. But um, I'm teaching her how to read. So this was interesting for me because now when she's identifying words, I say, sweetie, what's the first letter? What's the last letter? And that's kind of a technique that I'm using to try to help her read because, because of this research. Um, so mathematics is a language, but if you're not familiar with the symbols and you're not familiar with the grammar and you're not familiar with the syntax, <coughs> then it's difficult to decode it. And mathematics is a bit of a scary language to decode because the symbols are arcane. I mean, even symbols that you're familiar with here in a mathematical context using mathematical terminology becomes much more difficult to understand. So is numeracy a problem? Well, in the UK in 1997, they did a study called Does Numeracy Matter? Now, I'm not going to start reading slides to you because you guys can read, so I'm just going to quickly call up all this stuff. Some of this stuff is not surprising. You know, that if you have poor numeracy and literacy skills that you end up doing manual occupations. This next one was interesting, though. That it's closely followed, not by those with poor literacy and good numeracy. Right? Like, look, if you've got strong literacy and numeracy, those people tend to do best. If you've got weak literacy and numeracy, then those people don't do best. So there's some folks in the middle. There's some folks that have strong numeracy but weak literacy. And they have strong literacy but weak numeracy. Different groups of people. I'm going to talk about these people again in a moment. So where do they fit on the continuum? And what they found was that if you have strong literacy as opposed to weak numeracy, that you're only slightly behind those folks that have poor skills in both. Whereas if you have strong numeracy skills with poor literacy skills, then you're closer to the folks that are strong in both skills. So is numeracy a problem? <laughs> I know, again, so a lot of this stuff is... So that's what I'm saying. You've got a burr under your saddle. <laughs> in a Canadian study, Canada in 2003, published the results of a study that was done internationally. Six countries participated in the study. The results of the study are this. Um, some of the stuff is, again, not surprising. That, you know, literacy and numeracy skills do contribute to your social and economic well-being. This was surprising. 48%, they, they graded people's competency and literacy on a five-point scale. So three's right in the middle. And they said, look, to say, to, they called competence level three out of five. And they found that 48% of adult Canadians score under level three in Canada. They find that 55% of Canadians score under level three in numeracy skills. Um, and this was the shocker. This was, they had trouble explaining this. They did, this study is a, is a second time around on a study, same study that was done 10 years earlier. And they see that there's very little change. Why is that? We said this already, that there's a positive relation between uh, these various literacy skills. Um, hidden problem. They talk in this report about the hidden problem. And the hidden problem that they talk about is those people in the middle that I was talking about just a second ago. You either have strong literacy with weak numeracy, or strong numeracy with weak literacy. Those people, they call that the hidden problem in this report. And I think there's a bit of a hidden problem too. I think the problem goes a little deeper. Now, there's some math teachers in the audience, yeah? Math teachers anywhere? Am I alone? Okay, thank you. One friend. <laughs> um, you ever go to a dinner party? This is going to happen all the time. You go to a dinner party and you meet people for the first time and find out you're a math teacher, and it's one of the two reactions, right? You either get the reaction that love math. Math was great. I, maybe 5% or less of the time we get that reaction. Far more often we get this one. <laughs> Oh, I hated math. Couldn't stand math. I think it's genetic. My mother hated math. Her grandmother hated math. Could you imagine at the same party? Oh. 
Do the English teachers have the same problem? Do you, do you walk into the party and, they, and people laugh at you across the table and say, oh, I'm functionally illiterate? Does that happen? The English teachers? To anybody? Could you imagine sitting at a dinner table, having a conversation with someone, and they turn to you and say, I'm functionally illiterate? It would never happen. But why is it okay to say, I'm completely illiterate? You can't do that for beans. Especially when it's looking like it's a more and more important issue. Now, this is the attitude. I don't know if you can see that because it's blurry. Can you? Yeah. You want me to read it to you quick? Uh, so you got Linus and Sally there. And Linus says, now we cut an apple in half and we have two halves, don't we? That's fractions. You're trying to teach me fractions. You know I'll never understand fractions. What are you trying to do to me? I'll go crazy. And this is the accepted <laughs> attitude. Now, when you have kids, you might feel a little different about <laughs> being enumerate. Because when your kids bring their math homework, home and they're stuck. Do you, yeah, are you comfortable saying call the dog Carol? But don't you want to be able to help your kids? Don't you know I I don't like being this fellow. We have very different attitudes about learning to drive. I mean, I have a very strong belief that everybody, assuming that there's no mental challenge that the person faces, assuming that you don't have any kind of mental challenge, I have a very strong, firm belief that any student, any student, can not only take advanced math, but can be very successful in advanced math. My, and I tell my students this all the time, the marks that you get in school have nothing to do with your intelligence and everything to do with the amount of time, energy, and effort that you put into the course you're taking. So because you get poor marks in a subject doesn't mean you're stupid and don't let anyone ever tell you that. If you're getting poor marks, it's because you're not putting the time in. If you actually did all the stuff your teachers tell you to do, because let's be honest, folks, if they just did what we told them to do, wouldn't they do all right? So I think it's really possible, but we don't have that attitude. The hidden problem is cultural. We don't have that attitude that anybody can learn math. We don't have the attitude that if you, it's something that you should continue to work at until you're successful. We do have that attitude about driving. And we think that anybody should be able to learn how to drive. <laughs> like if they fail, the drive, they might fail the first time they take the test, but you'll go back and do it again. You're not going to stop because you failed, of course. <laughs> right? It's a driving test. Of course, it's unquestionable you're going to go back and take it again, and everybody should be able to learn how to drive. <laughs> so is numeracy a problem? Well, maybe we should turn that question around. The real question is, in, is innumeracy a problem? So... Let's explore this a little bit. My bias probably shows. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few different examples. And I'm going to, maybe through humor and through some concrete examples, stuff that you're going to counter every day. If you're reading the newspaper, if you're watching the news, the bulletins that we get from the Ministry of Education, stuff that comes from the government, stuff you have to read. You have to go through this stuff. Um, do you know when you're being lied to? Do you, do you know when someone uh, is fudging the numbers? Can you tell that the numbers have been fudged? Can you tell that the person who wrote the article maybe didn't know so much math? I'll give you an example. It was a few years ago um, when that West Nile virus thing came out. And there was an article on the front page of the uh, free press. And the article said, Everyone was really worried about it. And, it, and the article said that uh, the chances that a, a, a particular mosquito is actually carrying the West Nile virus is, is 0 0.01. And even if you get bitten by a mosquito that has the virus in it, the chance that you then actually contract the disease is also 0 0.01. And the article was written in a, in a way to kind of, you know, yes, you know, be cautious, like don't be silly, but don't, be, don't overreact either. Well, let's do the math. If the probability that the mosquito has 
last mile is 0.1, and the probability that you also contract that is 0.1. When you multiply them together, you get 0.001. Now that's one out of 10,000. Now Winnipeg has 700 people, approximately, we're probably pushing 800,000 people now, which means that we can expect in Winnipeg somewhere between 70 and 80 cases of West Nile virus. Are you comforted by that? Because <laughs> I wasn't. And, and, and I, I didn't think, I wasn't worried about it to that degree either, because I kind of felt whoever wrote that article needed to sit in on a probability class. Okay, it's not a real article. This is a joke. The uh, three Brazilian soldiers killed, so the Secretary of Defense is, is, is sitting with the President and he's briefing him about the daily news. And he says to him, three Brazilian soldiers reporting all these different events and the President, three Brazilian soldiers are killed, he breaks down. He's like, obviously shook up and everybody's worried. And they say, Mr. President, and finally he looks up and he says, three Brazilian soldiers. Just how many is a Brazilian? <laughs> okay. I got it. Now I got to tell you that um, this, the, talk, the talk this afternoon is being recorded. So everything I say is actually going to get recorded and published on the internet as a podcast afterwards. You'll get the link so you'll be able to re-listen to this. And I happen to know that some of my American friends are going to be listening when they hear me say this. So sorry, guys. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I mean, well, I'm not going to say any more about it. Um, do you know, do you have a benchmark for how big certain numbers are? Like in your mind, when you hear the word 1,000, like is that a meaningful number to you if you got your head around 1,000? Because I don't. I work in math, I teach math, and I've got a hard time with numbers like a thousand. Never mind talking about a million or a billion. Kathy Cassidy is a grade one, two teacher in um, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. And she teaches uh, in her class. Her cl she's got a really interesting class. Uh, let's see, let's hope the internet connection is working. Yahoo! Yay. So here's Kathy's class, and this is the website, this is a grade one, two teacher. And one of the things that Kathy, Kathy has is she's got a blog on her, that her class where they publish what they're learning on a regular basis. Uh, they've got family and friends kind of stay in touch with them. Uh, if you look at the related links, uh, they've got all kinds of stuff going on in their classroom. Um, notice that they're <coughs> connecting with Ms. Hayes' grade one blog in New Zealand. The kids in Saskatchewan, landlocked Saskatchewan, are communicating with kids that live by the ocean in New Zealand. And one day the kids at the ocean found a shark on the beach. They took a picture. Well, the kids in Moose Jaw, landlocked Moose Jaw, going, you found a what? You touched it? And so they sent a picture back. The kids in New Zealand, I don't think it, I don't know if they've seen snow. Well, they just took a picture of the class playing in the snow and sent it to New Zealand. Some interesting connections being made. She's trying to teach her kids what a thousand is. So she built a wiki. A wiki, uh, you may have heard of Wikipedia. A wiki is basically, it's a website that anybody can come along and change the content or add content to the website. She's trying to get the kids to understand what is a thousand. So she made a wiki and she published it on her blog and invited anybody who reads it to please come along, visit the wiki, and just add, you know, advance the number by one and put your name, just your first name, because we want to get a thousand names, because we want to see what does a thousand look like. Here's what a thousand looks like. Now I come in, uh, I found out about this, she hadn't quite gotten halfway, and this is me over here, so I was number 474. Now, they're up to number 662, they haven't made a thousand yet. Okay, all the links will be available. So, oh look, they got up to six, uh, 694, they haven't made a thousand yet. So do you have a sense of what a thousand is? Let's see. Let's play a game. I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you a lot of money. Okay. That's good. I got the lottery tickets, so let's go. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to give you a dollar every second. Every second you get a dollar. How long do we sit here until you get to a million? 
Are we talking minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years? What, what do you think? Just give me some ideas. Don't, you know, throw them out. Three days. Anybody else? Three weeks. Anybody else? Six months. Anybody? We're going to get a dollar a second. We want to, we're not going to stop. We're not, the deal is she's not going to the washroom either. We're going to sit here to get to a million. So now some people are doing some now. Well, a million in North America, around the world, a million is one with six zeros after it. And if you divide that by 60 seconds, you get how many minutes that is. Now, I told you, I've got a trouble. I've, about 100 is all I'm good for. Okay? I, other than, once you get past 100, I have a hard time figuring out what that number is. So that number is too big. So if I divide that by 60, I'm going to get the number of hours. And I'm still, you know, that's beyond my mental capacity. So if I divide that by 24, I'm going to get the number of days. And it's going to take us, let's call that 12 days, 11.57, we'll call it 12 days, because we're into the 12th day, more than halfway. So a million is going to take me about 12 days, at a dollar a second, it gives you a sense of scale. But what about if it's a billion? Well, I mean, is that a big difference? I mean, because we hear it in the news, right? They said million dollars, billion dollars. Is there a difference? Well, there's a difference. But just now, quick, don't, you know, but don't trying to do all the calculations. What do you think? How much time are we talking about now? If a million is 12 days, and remember, if you give me a number bigger than 100, uh, I'm lost. So, 11,000, is it? If you give me a number bigger than 100, I'm lost. So are we talking about days, weeks, months, years, eons? What are we talking about? Best guess. You got to give me numbers under 100. Like, give me the unit of time. No, you can see weeks, days, months, years, decades. So what is it? Three and a half years. Anybody else? We got three and a half years. Just throw it out. Four years. It won't be a test. Four, four years. Four years. Anybody else? Eleven. 11.57 years. Well, let's do the math. Now, you should know about this, that in Canada, well, North America, what we call a billion is not called a billion anywhere else in the world. What? What we call a billion in North America is not a billion anywhere else in the world. The rest of the world calls it a thousand millions. And if you put three more zeros, the number we call a trillion, if you put three more zeros, that's what they call a billion. In French, French teachers? Any French teachers? Speak French, maybe? In milliards? Right? It's, that's a billion. It's a mil... It's not, it's a French thing. Yeah? <laughs> no, it's international, except North America. So that's the number of minutes. And like I said, unless it's under 100, I got no idea what's going on. So that's minutes. So there's our hours. There's our days. This is our years. So let's call it 32 years. Who's going to give me a dollar or something? So you're getting a sense of scale. Like in terms of time. Now pick me up that, right? If we start talking about a trillion now, <laughs> three more zero. I won't I won't make you go down to less to a number less than a hundred, but if, if if we throw if let me give you a sense. The Canadian annual budget of Canada. And correct me if I'm wrong, but were we looking at around five hundred million dollars? Is that right? Five hundred million. Uh, sorry, five five hundred billion. Five hundred billion dollars is about the annual Canadian budget. Okay. The annual budget of the U.S. is over a trillion dollars. So if I'm going to give her a trillion dollars at the rate of a dollar a second, I mean, look, your students haven't been alive yet for a billion seconds. So if I'm going to give a trillion dollars, are we going to live long enough? No. Multiply by a thousand. If we call that 32 years, then it will take us about 32,000 years 
at the rate of a dollar a second to get to a trillion. Got to change the hundred dollar bills, Darren. Got to change the hundred dollar bills. <laughs> now, that only gives you one sense of scale. Um, there's a wonderful site on the internet that'll give you a very concrete sense. What, is, what does a million look like? Um, this is the Megapenny Project. And what they've done here is they've tried to give people a way to visualize um, large numbers, starting with a penny. And they have all, these, all this information about it, the, the value, the width, the height, the weight, 0.1 ounces for one penny. Uh, what do 16 pennies look like? We stack them up, we move up, and we get uh, 1,000 pennies. It's 5 by 5 by 40 high. And it weighs 6 and a quarter pounds. That's 1,000 pennies. Now, a cubic foot has about 50,000 pennies, um, but we're trying to get out to, here's two cubic feet, about 100,000 pennies, and we're trying to get to understand what's a million. Uh, we put it into a metric. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> it's a US site. That's what a million pennies would look like. Now, that fellow, they call him Graham, and he's about five foot 10. So Graham's about five foot 10, and uh, a million pennies would be a, a, a very small wall. I guess if Graham took, I don't know, one, two steps forward, he'd have that little footstool in front of him. That's what a million looks like, if you take a million pennies. What do a billion pennies look? Well, here's 10 million. That's a nice sized room. Ten billion, ten, 10 million, how close to a billion are we? All we did was multiply a million by 10. We're not even close. It's like 1%. This is 100,000. And if you want to see what a billion looks like, it's about five school buses, solid. That's a billion. And we were talking about the budget of the United States going up to a trillion. So here's 10 billion. That's about 50 school buses, right? Covers almost a football field. A hundred billion isn't, we're not quite at a trillion yet. We need 10, ten of those oh. to get to a trillion, uh, which is only we currently in, in North America call that a trillion. Um, total number of pennies in circulation in the world right now, they estimate to be about 200,000, or sorry, 200 billion pennies. Uh, the weight of that is that many tons, 625,000 tons. Well, here's a trillion. I think it gets bigger. I, I love this site. You want to get a better idea of its size? Let's compare it to a football field, the Washington Monument, or Lincoln Monument, the Empire State Building, and the Sears Tower from Chicago. That's one trillion pennies. If you actually wanted to fill the entire Empire State Building with pennies, it would take you less than two trillion, and you'd have the entire Empire State Building filled up. The Sears Tower, about 2.8 trillion, or 2.6 trillion. A quadrillion, we've added three more zeros, it's getting out of hand. <laughs> this is how math people have fun. This is how we have fun. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to give you a sense of size. Where I'm going with this is I'm going to try to give you some tools. I'm going to try to give you the, uh, a sense of magnitude. I'm we're going to look at a graph now. This is a real newspaper clipping. This is what gets reported in your daily news as well. We're going to look at this through a mathematician's eyes, and we're going to see about what information is conveyed here. I don't know if you're looking at it now, if you see any issues with what's <coughs> up on the screen. And then, there's not going to be a test, but we'll, we'll practice the skills a little bit. I want to, after that, show you a little bit about some suggestions I've collected. I also maintain a blog, and uh, I put, in preparing for the session, I put a request out on my blog saying, if anybody has samples of how they weave the teaching of numeracy into their classes, non-math classes, um, let me know. And I had people contribute, and they, some interesting stuff came up. I'm going to share it with you. Um, and anybody who stands in front of you and says, look, folks, you want to read numeracy into your curriculum, here's how you do it. They're lying. 
It's not that straightforward in the same way that when our literacy consultants stand up here and tell us, look, this is how you lead literacy in the curriculum. There's some good pointers there, but that's what it is. Each of us really has to find our own way. Now, we've come off of a long stint where they've been hammering us with literacy across the curriculum. And as a math teacher, I've been thinking about it seriously. And I've looked at different ways to weave that into my teaching. So when we're done today, what I want to do is try to take you through this question through the other end. As a math teacher having to teach literacy, this is what I do. And I'm going to leave it open to your creativity to find appropriate ways to weave numeracy into your curriculum. The math teachers love the movies, though. They're great in class. OK, so let's look at this. Any issues? Did anybody come up with this? It's, uh, in this, now this is in Australia, uh, in Victoria. and. The, the, the article was about people uh, spending money by gambling. They're dipping into the household funds or they're dipping into savings and, and what impact that's having on people. And this graphic was meant to illustrate the problem. We're short on time, so I'm going to run through it quickly. If you take a look right here, this coin is supposed to represent half of a percent. And right next to it, we've got something that's supposed to represent 7%. So two coins at 7%, one coin, half of 1%. Well, which is it? Is, is one coin half of a percent, or is it three and a half percent? Do the sizes, the, 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 the heights of any of those graphics make sense at all? Is there a message that's being conveyed to me that is meaningful? I don't think so. But when you look at it at first, you go, oh, well, okay, you know. That's what people consume, the graphic image. Do you know how to take apart that graphic image, do some comparisons, and see what's there? And are you being shared an authentic message? Is someone lying to me or is someone just enumerate? I got more problems with this. They tried to do a, um, a circle graph and they tried to be creative with it. So what did they do? They drew it down in perspective as part of a roulette wheel. Any issues with that? I have issues with that. Art teachers know that when you draw something in perspective, the stuff that's supposed to be closer to you is drawn larger than it actually is, and the stuff that's, supposed to, that's farther away from you is drawn smaller than it actually is. So they emphasize this piece is supposed to be the smallest piece, but it's drawn larger than it should be. This, the largest piece of the bunch, has been drawn smaller than it should be because it's at the back. If you're going to draw a circle graph, be creative with it, but keep it up straight and make sure that all the sides, all the different pieces are proportional. Um, I've got issues with these percentages. This is OK, but down here. OK, so in 1994, they did percent of the population is what I'm reading. And these are the different ways they spent the money. Add that up. It's more than 120%. They got some kind of population boom down there. In 1995, it seems there was a decline in the population because if you add those numbers up, it's about 108%. H how? How did they get 108% of the population? Percent means out of 100. Okay, you got $100, you give me 108. Well, he gives me $100. Well, where's the other eight? Well, no, I don't have 100. It means out of 100. Case, you got 100, you can't give 108. In that case, doesn't it, doesn't it point out that, that some people are, are gambling on more than one thing? Good. Very good. I mean, that's impressive. I teach English. That's wonderful. Yeah, but, but that information should be conveyed to us, right? There should be some notation that more than, you know, some people fit into more than one category. But that, unless you're looking at it carefully, the thought doesn't occur to you. That's, now, there's some assumptions that you're making there. Yeah, but, but, um, yeah, there, but generally that's, you know, this is yeah. between media. Yeah. What is the purpose of this? Is to make everything down and do the math or just get this general idea that I'll spend too much money on gambling? I suspect that the, the impression they're trying to convey mm -hmm. is that we're spending too much money on gambling. Yeah. Okay, I mean, that's clearly from the way they've skewed the representations. It's towards underscoring that we're spending too much money on gambling. You don't say how much it is. My, I would say that it really doesn't matter what socioeconomic bracket you're in. Yeah. 
no matter whose class you're sitting in, it's our responsibility, particularly when we work in the public sector, we gotta teach them all the same stuff and they all need to walk out of our classrooms with the skills to look at this and say, there's almost nothing on that picture that's been drawn meaningful. Yes, but part of our task is to present the data and to decode the symbols that are being, that were being provided with data. We want to prepare the kids for a life beyond the classroom. It's interesting, as teachers, you don't know if you're successful until they're long past your class, and by that time it's too late to find out. See, when you're, re when you're reading those numbers where it says Victoria and Scandal on what, I mean, the, the bottom line is that I read that and I go, okay, obviously the bulk of it is on that Tetzla, Tetzlo, or whatever. Yeah. And I would, I would not have done the math. Right. Like, yeah, you would have said, this is the biggest one, and I would have left it alone. I said, okay, obviously, poker machine is not as, uh, not as popular, popular as whatever that first one is. Right. But there's a lot more information here, like, like this. You're to dissect it. Yeah, and, and that's, that's looking at information with numerate eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't say, it says it's an $89 million a week gambling habit. Tisk, tisk, okay, because habit is bad. Yeah. So we've already got a, a bias. Well, but good habits are good. Yeah, but anyway, go on. Bad. Yeah. Took those two words together yeah. in context. Yeah. But it, it says, okay, it's coming out of the housekeeping living budget, 45% is coming out of there. Okay. It doesn't tell, it doesn't give anything about income level, it doesn't give anything. Right. If we spend 20 bucks a week on gambling and we're part of that gambling habit, it's not a big deal. Right. But if we're making minimum wage or less, yeah. and we're spending $40 on it, that's a bigger deal. Right. It gives no context. Well, I mean, I didn't, I didn't put the whole article up there. Other numbers are in terms of. You're right, we should look into the text and the graphics yeah. that we really need to be literate. We really need to look at both and decode both. Yeah. Um, and there was more information in, in the rest of the text okay. article, but I didn't want to give you a slide full of text. Yeah, who yeah. reads text? They all look at that. That's right. People look at that and say, oh my, big problem. But it's That's not right. necessarily Which was so. the rest of the article. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, well, I'll until we're in five minutes for the last Great. Now, the depth that you guys are taking this thing in our website so just showed that. I don't know. Yeah. Wow. I would have just stayed in the Facebook because I really couldn't care. But. Is that so? I don't think you that. I'm just saying, I'm seeing my random abstract English teaching thinking and your concrete sequential math thinking, and I'm thinking, wow, I really have been living in this other shell that doesn't think very deep at all. <laughs> that you walk away from this and you're going to look at those kinds of images maybe with new eyes, um, that you might stop, you know, take an extra second to have a look at it. Uh, what's probably more important to take away from this is that maybe you and Carol get together and your kids work on a project. Like the education the kids, that those kids are getting in grade one and grade two, because their classroom walls are transparent and they encompass the entire plan. So when I say that you should get together maybe with Carol and do a project, what I'm saying is open the doors to your classroom. I think you should open up to the world. I'll show you in a minute, but, but at least within your same building, if you're gonna do this, I mean, I'm getting ahead of myself. I think the way you're gonna get at numeracy across the curriculum is through what is probably for students the most powerful kind of learning that they do, which is project work. I know that in math, like my department, we sit around and we say, what's the best stuff that we do? What's the best stuff that our kids learn the most from? And it comes back every year, it's the same thing, project work, where they have to work on something over an extended period of time. So part of that project is collecting some information and representing it. Well, drop in on the math teacher, you know, is it authentic? Well, to make myself feel better that I'm not quite as dumb. Um, we actually are kind of doing that here where we have combined numeracy with science and English together with the science fair. That's uh, fantastic. Yeah, we're, we're working with the science teachers and the English teachers in grade nine and working together to produce the kids to work on their science fair projects and cover it all in the both grade And I think that's the way to do it. It's not extra work for you, it's what you have to do anyways. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, let's look at another one. Beware the pushy fish eater. Now this one's just for fun. I'm not knowing. Is that trout? Whatever it is, it's a fish head. Um, yeah. So there's this study done by John West Foods, and it says, if you read it, it says men who eat a lot of fish are driven by ambition and the desire for success. This comes out of Britain. Um, seven in ten men who frequently eat canned tuna or other fish admit to being ambitious, and one in two rate themselves as more successful than others. This is just, you know, this is a filler story, right? I mean, this is not earth shattering news. That's interesting. The, someone went and contacted John West Foods and asked them, well, this study, how many people were in the study? There were 250. Exactly half of them were men and half of them were women. Okay? Fish eaters. And it had to be male fish eaters, right? It says seven in ten men. Seven in ten. Turns out that when we actually go to look at the data, six of the men characterize themselves as frequent eaters of fish. Six. Where did they get seven out of ten? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do they do? How many? Four out of the six describe themselves as being ambitious as well as enjoying fish. Four out of six, two thirds, 67%. Round it up, you get seven out of 10. Is six people enough to talk about this? <laughs> right, and this gets reported in the news. I like fish, I must be ambitious. Oh yeah, this is one of those things. Um, you're going to like this. This, this is it from Canada. This is uh, the British Columbia government puts together a handbook for parents, students. Who gets together? The government of British Columbia gets together with the Math Teachers Association of BC and puts together a handbook on numeracy for secondary students for the parents. And in that booklet, you'll find this graph. And this graph, it says at the bottom, I don't know if you can read it, it says the chart shows the amount of time spent on each of the sets of mathematical ideas at various grades. Well, let's look at this. This is pre-K to 3, 4 to 7, 8 to 10, 11 to 12. These are the math teachers got together and did this, right? There's four grades there. There's two here. That's the same width. Now, when I look at that, I look like number. These are the four different kinds that we call them strands in math. These are the four strands. Well, it looks like number is kind of becoming less important and patterns and relations more important over the grade levels. Okay, I get that. But look at the shape of these things. Right in here, right there, <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> <laughs> now, now, okay, maybe that's four to seven. Four, five, six, seven. There's four grades in there. Okay, so that's grade four. What are they doing over grade five? <laughs> As the year progresses, we're going to do less and less math. So what are we, are we taking the knowledge out of the kids? <laughs> what is the scale here? Is this time? I don't know. Is this seconds, minutes, hours, days, months, years? Is this percentages? What is this? This is a completely meaning, meaningless graph because they haven't scaled it properly. One of the things that we say to students in math is that you've got to scale your axes properly. You don't put a scale, I've got no idea what you're talking about. Okay, here's the test. Let's have some fun and uh, we're going to test your numeracy skills. I'm going to give you some of these notes. people there. Okay, here's the thing. Part of being numerate is looking at data in various forms. You've seen graphical data, you've seen numeric data. This is numeric data presented in a table. Something happened. It's called the unusual incident. Now, some people get it very quickly. Some people, we can spend maybe up to an hour looking at this. Okay? The reason that I ask to have you sitting in, in tables and groups is because in my view, and something I say again and again in my classroom, is learning is a conversation. If you're not talking to somebody about it, you're not learning. So let's see what you can do with this information. 
Look at the information presented in the data in the tables. Talk to the people sitting around you. And see if you can figure out what happened. <laughs> this is a point in my classes where I would insist I'd go around and I'd find the people that aren't having a conversation because you've had enough time to get some ideas. So if you're not talking to somebody about it, you're not learning it, and you're not, you're not in it. But what we're going to do, maybe it's time for a cup of coffee. And I'll let you go on coffee. Let's say we're going to take, it's almost a quarter to. Let's, uh, can we come back at 5 to? Okay, give it almost 15 minutes break. Come back at 5 to, and uh, we'll play 20 questions. If you haven't figured it out over break, We'll play 20 questions and we'll see if we can figure it out. You know, all of us together may know more than any of us alone. So let's see if we can do with that. We're back at 5-2.